introduce tonight's lecturer, Terence McKenna, with the release of his captivating new book, True Hallucinations. Terence McKenna has given many of us renewed hope that the philosopher's stone as fungus is finally within modernity's reach. During, the, uh, during this sleepless period, I sat one night uh, on this laundry rock below the police house where Dennis was incarcerated, and he was more or less incarcerated because he refused to keep his clothes on, and anything put in a room with him, he would hurl out the window. He even hurled the window frame out the window. So he was thorough. <laughs> I said nothing to anyone, but I formed the resolve not to spend that sleepless night as I had spent the others, wandering the fields like this fox spirit or meditating at the choro. Rather, I would sit here where the lake emptied and the Agara Parana resumed its languid course, here at the boat landing, 70 feet down a steep mud bank from the river house, I would sit through the night and watch. And so, all night long I sat reviewing the things that had passed, seeming to divide my consciousness and send it both backward through my family tree and forward into the future. I seemed to see all the years ahead. I saw some technique emerging from this contact, which I now think is the technique for growing Stropharia cubensis. Our careers pursued across space and time, and finally vindication as the world realized the truth of the transdimensional nature of the Stropharia visions and the true nearness of the worlds that they had thrown open. For it had become my belief that the contact with an intelligent and utterly alien species was beginning for humanity. It seemed that out of the long night of cosmic time, the novelty of novelties, the moment of contact between minds on utterly different planes was beginning. We were among the first to achieve contact with this other species. It was the real thing. We had come to the equatorial jungle to explore the dimensions glimpsed in tryptamine ecstasy, and there in the darkness of the heart of the Amazon, we had been found and touched by this bizarre and ancient life form that was now awakening to the global potential of a symbiotic relationship with technical humanity. All night long, strange vistas and insights poured through me. I saw gigantic machineries and worlds of vegetable and mechanical forms on scales inconceivably vast. Time, agatized and glittering, seemed to pour by me like living superfluids inhabiting dream regions of terrible pressure and super cold. And I saw the plan, the mighty plan, at last. It was an ecstasy, an ecstasis that lasted hours and placed the seal of completion on all of my previous life. At the end, I felt reborn, but as what, I knew not. In the gray of a false dawn, the wave of internal imagery faded away. I rose from where I had been sitting for hours and stretched. The sky was clear, but it was still very early and stars were still shining dimly in the west. In the southeast, the direction from which, uh, toward which <clears throat> my attention had been focused, the sky was clear except for a line of fog or ground mist lying parallel to the horizon only a few feet above the treetops on the other side of the river, perhaps a half a mile away. As I stretched and stood up on the, on the flat stone where I had been sitting, I noticed that the line of fog seemed to have grown darker and now seemed to be churning or rolling in place. I watched very carefully as the rolling line of darkening mist split into two parts and each of these smaller clouds also divided apart. 
It took only a minute or so for these changes to be executed, and I was now looking at four lens-shaped clouds of the same size lying in a row and slightly above the horizon, only a half mile or so away. A wave of excitement swept through me, followed by a wave of definite fear. I was glued to the spot, unable to move as if in a dream. As I watched, the clouds recoalesced in the same way they had divided apart, taking another few minutes. The symmetry of this dividing and rejoining, and the fact that the smaller clouds were all the same size, lent the performance an eerie air, as if nature herself were suddenly the tool of some unseen organizing agency. As the clouds recoalesced, they seemed to grow even darker and more opaque. As they all became one, the clouds seemed to swirl inward like a tornado or a water spout, and it flashed into my mind that perhaps it was a water spout, something I still have never seen. But even as the thought formed, I heard a high-pitched, ululating whine come drifting over the jungle treetops, obviously from the, the direction of the thing I was watching. I turned and gave one glance at the river house 70 feet behind me and up the steep hill, ga gauging whether I had time to run and awaken someone to get confirmation of what was happening. To arouse someone, I would have had to go hand over hand up the slope and consequently take my eyes off the thing I was watching. In the space of an instant, I decided that I could not cease observing. I tried to shout but no sound came from my fear-constricted throat. The siren sound was gaining pitch, and in fact, everything seemed to be speeding up. The moving cloud was definitely growing larger rapidly, moving straight toward the place where I was. I felt my legs turn to water and sat down, shaking terribly. For the first time, I truly believed in all that had happened to us, and I knew that the flying concrescence was now about to take me. Its details seemed to solidify as it approached. Then it passed directly over head in an altitude of about 200 feet, banked steeply upward, and was lost from sight over the edge of the slope behind me. In the last moment before it was lost, I completely threw open my senses to it and saw it very clearly. It was a saucer-shaped machine, rotating slowly with unobtrusive, soft blue and orange lights. As it passed over me, I could see symmetrical indentations on the underside. It was making the whee, whee, whee sound of science fiction flying saucers. My emotions were all in a jumble. At first, I was terrified. But the moment I knew that whatever was in the sky was not going to take me, I felt disappointment. I was amazed, and I was trying to remember what I had seen as clearly as possible. Was it real in the naive sense in which that question is asked of UFOs and tables and chairs? No one else saw this thing, as far as I know. I alone was its observer. I believe that had there been other observers, they would have seen essentially what I have reported. But as for real, who can say? I saw this thing go from being a bit of cloud to being a rivet-studded aircraft of some kind. Was it more true to itself as cloud or aircraft? Was it a hallucination? Against my testimony can be put my admitted lack of sleep and our involvement with psychedelic plants. Yet curiously, this last point can be interpreted in my favor. I am familiar through direct experience with most classes of hallucinogens. What I saw that morning did not fall into any of the categories of hallucinated imagery I am familiar with. Yet also against my testimony is the inevitable incongruous detail that seems to render the whole incident absurd. It is that as the saucer passed overhead, I saw it clearly enough to judge that it was identical with the UFO with three half spheres on its underside that appears in an infamous photo by George Adamski, widely assumed to be a hoax. 
I had not closely followed the matter, but I accepted the expert opinion that what Adamski had photographed was a rigged up end cap of a Hoover vacuum cleaner. <laughs> but I saw this same object in the sky above La Chirera. Was it a fact picked up as a boyhood UFO enthusiast? Something as easily picked out of my mind as other memories seem to have been? My stereotyped but already debunked notion of a UFO suddenly appears in the sky. By appearing in a form that casts doubt on itself, it achieves a more complete cognitive dissonance than if its seeming alienness were completely convincing. So, Cold, but my head is dry and the sky is falling. Up. 